Welcome to the fight with Teddy Atlas presented by Dynamic Striking. I'm Ken Rideout, joined as always by the voice of combat sports, my friend Teddy Atlas. Teddy, how you doing? Good, good. I want a drum roll because uh, if I can get one. Yeah. To let, there it is. There it is. See? I get what I want. I, I, I want to tell everybody out there, I want to announce that my partner here, Ken Rideout, He's still in Germany right now, and he just ran in the Berlin Marathon over the weekend, and it's one of the six major marathons, biggest marathons in the world, and he, in a field of over 3,000 in his field, there was 45,000 people in the race. In the master's class, 50 and old, for Ken had over 3,000 people in that, and the best runners in the world former professional runners, obviously, many of them. And Ken, just extraordinary. He ran a second. Now, I know I know a lot of people are going to say, well, he didn't win, and Ken said that already. I didn't win. But to me, and probably nobody is more stern or harsh when it comes to the difference between winning and losing. Um, but he didn't lose. He won. And I'll explain it real quickly why he won. And I knew this before I even got all the information from him other than he came in second. He overcame. He was in a race at the 20-mile mark. He was done, dead, hit a wall. And um, thought about, you know, thought about capitulating, thought about submitting, but he didn't. When you meet adversity head on, when you, you know, the devil knocks at your door, as I like to say sometimes, and you spit in his face, you won. You didn't lose. You won. Because that's what it's all about. It's about a fight's not a fight until there's something to overcome. And when you overcome that, when you don't submit to that, when you don't give in to that, you've won. You've won. And you've made yourself proud and everyone around you proud. Because again, you didn't capitulate. You didn't submit. You didn't put the white flag up. You went on. At the end, you know, uh, he, he was carried off in a stretcher. Um, he's not the only guy. Other runners are too. But in other words, he left it on the battlefield. He left it all out there on the battlefield. And that's all you can ever do is uh, this damn fax machine. That Hold on. I, I mean, that's what happens when you're a caveman. You got a fax machine. Wait a minute. There it goes. I wish that the fax machine would capitulate. Um, you know, Ken wouldn't capitulate. Ken wouldn't submit the freaking fax machine. That, but it's a Teddy Atlas fax machine. What do you expect? It's not going to give up too easy. The bottom line is that we're proud of you. And I wanted to just tell you that before we started to show you. You're in your hotel room there in, in Germany still. And um, please, again... Allow yourself to feel the way that I feel and the way that Rob, our producer, feels. Is that, again, you you met the enemy and um, you, didn't, you didn't give in to the enemy. You fought. And you, you fought past where there was pain. You fought past that realm, that threshold, you know, of where it's kind of telling you, you did enough. But you knew that there was still somewhere else you could go. And you did. You went, as I talk about with these great fighters stuff we talk about all the time, you went and you found light in a dark room. Because it was dark. I know that. I know how it gets. And you kept going, seeking that light. And again, that's all we can ever do. That's all we can ever do. So... Congratulations, Ken. And um Thank you, Teddy. And you you let the fans know now, let us all know now a little bit of the details of the race, please. And I know that in the overall race, the greatest marathon runner of all time won. And if I'm not if I'm correct, he ran the fastest marathon of all time that was that that's actually an official marathon. So go ahead. That's right. Yeah, that was Elliot Kipchoge, and uh, 
Huge thanks to the Berlin Marathon organizers. They had me do some German media. I did some interviews for them. Um, they had me in the professional field. So I literally was lacing up my shoes, sitting next to Elliot Kipchoge, who, you know, wow. for running for runners and running fans, it would be like, you know, being in a locker room with Tom Brady for a football fan for fans. But you're actually going to go on the same field and play in the same game. So it was a little bit surreal. You know, I, 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 I'm a fan of running. So to be sitting with a guy like this who's going to run a 201 marathon that's like under 440 per mile, like a full, mar- a full minute per mile faster than I've ever wow. run, it's, it's crazy. What but, was your uh, time? What was your time? Let the people yesterday. understand the context yeah. of this. What, what your time was, which was I, <laughs> 51 years old. Go ahead. Yeah, yesterday I ran 235. It was like 556 per mile. Um, I was hoping to run 225, 10 minutes faster, maybe 226. And I ran through the first half in 112.48. Uh, so right where I wanted to be, probably around 16 miles, I just started to fall apart like I never have before. I don't know if it was maybe the travel, or, you know, the international flights. I was there for, for four days before. That's not enough what? time to acclimate. Now, listen, I'm yeah. not your, I'm not making excuses for you, of course, but that's not enough for, for a fight. When we go to Europe, um, I always make sure we have two weeks, to be quite frank, um, yeah. or as close to that as possible. But four days, not enough time to acclimate properly when you no. go across those time zones. In hindsight, no. And the other benefit I had, like I, you know, I, I told you before, I have no excuses. I, I had done everything that I thought I had to do right. They, they, when you're in the pro field, every 5K, every five kilometers, they have special tables set up where the pros have their own water bottles marked with their names that you have your own special drink mix like Gatorade, calorie drinks. So I had everything i had all the accoutrements of the pros i thought for sure i'm going to have the best race of my life and like you said around 16 to 18 miles i started to go whoa uh, it's man uh, this is going to be this is about to get real hard and right around 18 to 20 miles i knew i was in hell <laughs> and I, I like you said i every five ten minutes i contemplated or tried to justify to myself you know what let me just stop and walk and gather myself but i know the minute you start walking is 15 minutes a mile for a walking pace. And I knew once I stopped, I wouldn't be able to move again because I, I was falling apart everywhere. And, um, you know, to your point, if, 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 you, if, no, if people have, listening haven't been there, when you start to get depleted of glycogen, I was like dizzy seeing stars, like my vision was blurred. I was as depleted as I could be. And you're right. I, I was in hell and I was like, you know what? I'm just either going to drop dead or get to that finish line at, at some point, I just said, I'm going to stop debating whether I should stop or not and just just go to the, I get to the finish line or can't or, or fall down. And thank God I made it to the finish line just in time to fall down. And uh, the medics took me away. And yeah, I got some medical treatment. And after an hour or two treatment, I was uh, able to walk back to the hotel. But, you know, sometimes the races that go perfectly you run through the finish line, feel great, celebrate, and everything is good. The races that go terribly, just it takes every ounce of energy to get to the finish line. And it was, I just was destroyed. And I still, you know, obviously I did what I did, but I was, you know, 10, nine to 10 minutes off my goal time. So yeah, I'm disappointed. I feel like it's a fight. I was winning in the 10th round and I got knocked out in the 12th, in the, in the 10th. And I was like, damn it, I had it all going and it just came apart at the seams and I don't have an easy answer for it and I don't have any excuses. I just, I just didn't have the legs. It just, I, I wish I, I wish I could point to something that went wrong so I could fix it. But you know, that's part of the marathon is it's a long way to go to see what you have the last six miles. Cause that's where the race is won and lost. And um, I just but didn't you, have it when I know, got there. To steal a phrase, a line from uh Mel Gibson in that great movie that I like to quote, Braveheart, which I think is truly a great movie. You know, years from now, laying in bed as an old man, you can look back and there's no regrets. You left it yep. all in Berlin. And that's, yep. that's really what it's about. You know, you, you don't look back and say, gee, I walked. Damn it, I walked. Damn it, if I didn't walk, maybe this could have happened. No, you didn't walk. You ran. You ran right to the freaking finish line. And um, that gives you the right for me to hear 
well, to hear your, your guy here, Teddy Atlas, talk about this, but it gives you more important rights than that. It gives you the right to demand and expect in the proper way as a teacher, as a father, from your children. Yes. As you get older. And that's a great yep. gift. That, that's a great, great, my God, that's a great gift. To be able to always say to your children, listen, you can do more. You can do more. And you have the right to say it. You earn the right to say it. So anyway, congratulations. Get back to uh, America soon. And let's do a podcast here, huh? What do you yeah, say? Yeah, the w- one thing I'll tell you about the children is they called me afterwards and my wife told them that I was very upset. And they called me and they were like, Dad, you did the best. You did great. You, you came in second. And it was almost like the more they told me that, the more emotional I got. And and I think that I could hear my wife explaining to them that I was emotional because I care so much about what I'm trying to do. And I think that, like you said, they're going to get those lessons whether directly or indirectly from what they see and how we behave and how we conduct ourselves in front of our kids. And, you know, if there's any highlight to this, it's they see how much I do care about the things that are important to me like them. And then listen, I care about running and that's why it's, um, I was upset because I was like, man, I put a lot of my heart and and effort into this. And, uh, you know, look, I'm proud of myself, but it wasn't, I, I came up a little short, but I, like Bill Belichick would say, I'm on to Chicago. Two weeks from today, I'll run the Chicago Marathon, have a chance to uh, right this wrong and go out with a different strategy, try to ease into it a little bit. So now I'm just going to recover. I'm going up to the uh, I'm going up to um, the Austrian Alps for a couple of days with a friend to relax. And um, actually, I'm going to a train a training facility where the Klitschko's used to train up in Kitzbühel, Austria. I'm, I'm, I'm going to send Rob some pictures. Maybe he can share them somewhere on the, um, on the, on the Instagram page for, for the fight. And, uh, but there's a boxing facility up there. I'm just going up to relax and get some mountain air and try and like take my mind off this for a couple of days. But my wife was nice enough to say, yes, yeah, stay and have a little while you're over there, stay and have some fun. So oh, relaxation. So I'm, I'm, I'm in Munich tonight. I'm going to go to a Oktoberfest um, event and then I go to Austria tomorrow. But um, thanks for all the kind words. I appreciate you. I got a ton of supportive messages from the fans. Thank you guys. I love you all. It's, it's, it almost makes it more emotional when you realize how many people are supporting you. You know, it's hard enough when I feel I, I'm disappointed myself, but when you see how many people are rooting and supporting you, it's, 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 it was overwhelming. Honestly, it was overwhelming. So thank you to everyone. Appreciate it. Let's talk some fighting. Yeah. And don't, with- and don't drink any of those yeast freaking beers or Yale ales <laughs> over there. Stay away from that. I'm okay? not a big drinker. <laughs> and, and I'm going to throw one thing in there that I know that we didn't talk about, but I got to throw it in there because my son just hit me up with it. Um, Mayweather KO'd Mercura as a cura over in Japan over the weekend. He had a much easier time than you did in the marathon, <laughs> let me tell you. Um, yeah. You know, he's 45 years old, Mayweather. We'll take two seconds on this because that's about it, um, that it deserves, to be honest. Not exactly. that we don't lo- love Mayweather. But he, um, he knocked out a Japanese MMA fighter who's 30 years old in the second round. You know he got paid a lot of money. I don't know what he got paid. But all I want to really say about that is Mayweather, he said this. This was his moniker years ago. He's so <laughs> he's so right. Easy money, baby. Easy money. And he's still making his easy money. Hey, listen, he earned the right to do that throughout a you know, great career. But... Um, at, at this pace, fighting these kind of guys at 45 now, he could probably keep this up to 75, you know, um, you know, and, and keep bringing in this easy money. But anyway, just figure we'd say that. The other couple of things I want to give a real quick mention. I don't need a drum roll. Um, I don't need a drum roll. That goes to my, my friend Ken. But I I made... 30 pounds. I finally lost the 30 pound mark. I know a lot of you asked, did he get to 30 pounds yet? Yes, I got to 30 pounds and um, I got on the scale. I I hit the weight. And then yesterday was uh, me and my wife's 40th anniversary. So we went, my family took us to Peter Luger's. I have my son in here, my grandchildren, everybody, my my son-in-law my daughter teddy as i said my son so we all went over to peter lucas had a great meal 
And again, it's always full disclosure, Ken. You know that you like, like we like to be honest. Um, I'm I'm not. Uh, I put a couple pounds back on. Put it, but I made the official weight. That's all that matters. I made the official. It was verified by the WBC. They if had you, a, the, oh, they had, you they just, had a super. Just, they had a supervisor there. The WBC you, had. They even gave me one of their patches. Listen, listen. I was about they to said, congratulate Don't worry you. about it. You could go. <laughs> Don't worry about it. You could go. No, no. All kidding aside, we this was a real wait. But if the WBC later, verified it, I'm going to have to call it into question just on principle. Yeah, I would too. <laughs> and but the one thing of good about the WBC is that if they verified it and they give you a WBC patch later on, I could go to Peter Lucas, which we did. We had an incredible meal. It's the best steakhouse in New York and, and one of the best in, in the, the world. world. Uh, I, yeah, it, it's incredible. I've never had a bad steak there. But anyway, we go there and then the ice cream sundaes afterwards. Listen, I got to be honest. I, I tasted a couple a little bit. Um, and, uh, and I, like I said, I, the good thing about if you do mess with the WBC, I could, after that meal, I could have gotten back on the scale and I still would have made, matter of fact, I would have been five <laughs> pounds lighter. <laughs> I would have, yeah, I would have been five pounds lighter because that's the way it works. That's just the way it works, the magic of the WBC if you're friends with them. Uh, and the only thing is they did ask me to buy a steak dinner. I mean, there's always some kind of surcharge. They that's did what ask they, me to, they make you buy a steak dinner just to get you uh, for the right to get weighed. Yeah, I mean, um, but I just want to say that also uh, over the weekend or last week, the foundation, the Dr. Atlas Foundation, we had our 18th annual golf outing. It was an unbelievable success, beautiful day. All the restaurants on Staten Island put food on all the holes. It, it, it was really, it's... Any it's hole in an ones? Uh, there's a, no, nobody got it. My friend Keith Sullivan, who's a lawyer for the, it would have been pro, but then people would say, oh yeah, he's with the foundation, whatever. But he, um, Keith Sullivan came within like an inch of getting a whole one. And we have Lexus car there. We have a Lincoln car there. Um, all of that. But he just missed the whole one. Last year we had a whole one though. But it was, it was really good. It was great. And last but not least, uh friday i was asked to go up to yukon to speak to the program up there and um the legendary family the hurley family anyone knows basketball ken you know the hurley family i mean bobby hurley uh the legendary coach you know he had that saint anthony's high school program that he just incredible incredible and he just he didn't only teach kids how to play basketball and they some of them went on well, a lot of them went on to Division One scholarships, changed their lives, and then when some went to the NBA. But more importantly, he turned these young kids into men from very difficult backgrounds, and and he um, he was there for all those years at Jersey City, and then he produced two sons, Danny and Bobby. Bobby, maybe the greatest college basketball player or guard of all time really uh one i think two national titles at duke incredible and he would have been an incredible nba player i think he would have been another john stockton or something i really mean that with his, his character his abilities everything out the way he was driven but he had a car accident he almost died um but thank god he lived he's a coach too but danny danny is a coach now the yukon program which was a tremendous program they won four national titles um they they went downhill and he's bringing them back uphill and he's doing an unbelievable job this danny hurley and i just want to say because it it just matches with the things that i i talk about that that mattered to me the most it's not just about talent he's got the most talent some of the most talented kids in the country obviously there and he went out and he handpicked them himself but he handpicked guys with character good human beings and I met all these kids and I talked to them and every one of them I looked in their eyes they're all good kids and there's a strength to that there's a strength to character there's a strength to to you know just to being to decency to believing in the right things and standing by those right things when you're tempted like I said when the devil knocks at your door and you're tempted into other things that are more convenient not quite as right and these that's part of the strength of this team I looked at his coaching staff no shock. All people that were handpicked by him that are people of character and talent and experience. 
Um, so it was really a pleasure talking to to Danny, getting to know him a little bit, talking to his team. Uh, I'm a UConn fan. I'm a Husky fan, baby. And, uh, you know, I, they invited me to go to Madison Square Garden for the Big East tournament, some of the other tournaments when they play there, and uh, I'll be there. But I just figured I'd say that because there's a lot of talented people out there, you know. And um, Danny had – this is what I want some of these kids to hear – Danny could pick, you know, the greatest athletes in the world, and he picked some of them. But some of them he didn't because they didn't match their athleticism and their athletic ability and their DNA and their great genetics with the other things that are even more important. Uh, the ability to make the right choices, the ability to make the right choices when it's easier to make the wrong choices. You know, just being a solid human being, a person that cares about the right things. And he picked those people. And I, it's just a message that that stuff's important. That that how you live is important. It's noticed. We, You know, a lot of the kids, when I go to these schools, these at-risk schools, and I go to them and I talk to them, um, a lot of times they'll say, you know, I say to them, you already learned that People notice when you do things wrong. <laughs> you learned that already. But I want you to learn and understand when you do things right, it's noticed. Sometimes that goes, people think that goes unnoticed. But it's noticed. It, it's noticed. It is. And that's why I'm here today. Because I know there's people here, you, you students, that have made the choice, a difficult choice to do the right thing. And that's why I'm here. So I want you to know that's noticed. I just... You know, I just wanted to say that before we got into the boxing stuff. And um, that's it. And again, proud of you, kid. Proud of you, kid. Uh, so let's go, baby. Thanks, Teddy. I appreciate you and Rob and Sam and all the guys for uh, the support. It means the world to me. You know, when I'm sitting over there in the hotel room by myself for several days, you got a lot of time to think. I know it's not a fight, but if for me, I'm not going to get punched in the face, but the mindset is the same as getting ready for a fight. The nerves, the anxiousness. Again, I know it's not as as dangerous, but I'm I'm getting my head around the fact that I'm going to do that. So when you get these messages, they mean a lot. And um, thank you. Thank Rob, everyone. I appreciate everything. Um, the one thing I would say to the college kids, I always want to some when I'm when when someone's talking to college kids and teams, especially when they've been recruited by a coach and you're invited to speak to the team on behalf of the coach, I want to tell them like, Hey, not just for yourself and your teammates, but this coach's reputation and his career is on the line. Recognize that you're not just playing for yourself and your teammates. This, this is this guy's job. He took a bet on you. He recruited you to come here. He's paying for your education. We can get into a whole debate about uh, college kids and pay and, and NCAA. It is what it is. But the point is this guy's put his reputation on the line by recruiting you and bringing you onto his team. If not for yourself, help this guy advance in his career and 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 he has a family and this is going to be compensated based on how you perform as a team and i think that that's a part that never really gets mentioned um but i always think about that as the coach who recruits the players in terms of getting the right characters but let's get into the boxing teddy there and was I'll, a leave it, I'll tip it tap it off with this that you touched on that you were saying you don't get punched in the face but you still felt like you were in a fight ken I say it all the time on this program. There's a reason why this podcast is called The Fight. Everyone's in a fight. Life is a fight. It's just a matter of what you fight for. That's it. Yep. Let's go. Let's That's go. right. Let's go. Young, young prospect in action. <clears throat> Keyshawn Davis looks a talented kid. Moves to 6-0. and oh. He's full of exuberance. Um he jumped all over uh, Omar Tienda, the Mexican, 25 and 6. Um, fifth round knockout in the lightweight division. Uh, Keyshawn moves to 6 and 0 with five KOs. How'd you like him? What'd you think? I, I, first of all, very talented. You're right. Um, I, I didn't, I don't think it was a knockout to fight, though. Um, the, ref, the, the ref jumped in and stopped it, but I mean, he was battering the kid. And the one thing I'll say about Tienda is he he was there to take a beat. And I mean, oh, he was just I'm sorry, I'm his, thinking. Of, I'm uh, no, no, yeah, you're right. That was a, yeah, I was thinking. I'm sorry. I, yeah, I, I no was problem. thinking of the main event. 
Yeah, um, yeah, yeah. No, no, no problem. But the Keyshawn, he was just pounding on Tienda. At times, Tienda, I was like, dude, I, you're not there to be a punching bag. He's just standing with his hands up and taking shots. I get it when you're overmatched, but I like to see Keyshawn move up against some, uh, I mean, I guess 25 and 6. They probably thought with the experience, Tienda might have more to offer. So you can't really blame Davis. But you gotta, he did what he listen, had to do, but man. You got to understand, these kids like Keyshawn Davis, he's a silver medalist from the Olympics. They probably had 200 or, or more amateur fights or somewhere in that neighborhood. So they're very experienced, even though they're young and they haven't yeah. had the pro fights. So I I think they can fight better guys sometimes. But And, and then you go back to De La Hoya, like him or hate him. You know, he fought... He, he was an Olympic gold medalist. He had all those amateurs. He fought pretty good fighters earlier uh, than these guys are doing nowadays on, on the same way Same with up. Lomachenko. Uh, Lomachenko, same thing. He was fighting for a world title against a very seasoned guy in his first pro fight, second, second pro fight, whatever. Um, yep. So, I, first of all, talented kid, but, you know, after a while, it's just like it's enough with these commentators telling you you're watching the greatest fighter of all time. Basically, uh, by the way, uh, chief chief cheerleader along those lines, Joe Tess, when you would think that Tess was calling a heavyweight unification fight the way he was reacting when they jumped in and stopped, um, not this one, but in the main event, like every fight with Tess is like he's calling the biggest fight in history. Like if you act like that with everything, it kind of lo- it's like the boy that cried wolf. What are you going to do when they when you are calling a, a title fight? It's just too much. It's over the top. It's like he did exactly what he was supposed to do. It was a little anticlimactic. But Tess will have you think that he just like, you know, he's calling Fury and uh, Usyk. Listen, these, it gets to be difficult. I don't know how the fans deal with it unless you're just a fanatical fan and you're not, you're blurring everything out and you just love the guy that they're, that they're giving a treatment to and you you know you don't care but if you're a serious fan and you care about you know more than just pom-poms um and cheerleading tactics i mean you want to i mean you want to slow down just a little bit you know before you're putting a guy and carving him out and putting him on the mount rushmore mountain of greatest fighters of all time i mean you know He's in there with a guy for a reason at this point. Uh, they they picked the guy for a reason to continue building him up and building his record up. And he goes and he gets him out of there with a nice counter right hand. No doubt about it. Well done. Uh, on the top of the head, behind the head, wherever it was. Uh, and again, he's not one of the greatest fighters. Maybe he'll become a great fighter. But... Right now, he's he's not because to be a great fighter, you got to be doing it for a period of time, and you got to be beating great fighters. And does he have real good potential? Yeah, a lot of kids do, and he does. But to start shoving it down our damn throats that we should understand because they're telling us that we're watching the greatest fighter. And in some ways, they were suggesting he's the best fighter. He's one of the greatest fighters right now in boxing. And that's just not fair. It's not honest. Because it's kind of like when I was watching a fight with Customato, somebody named Customato and Mike Tyson, when he was about 15 years old. And we're up in Catskill. Of course, I was training the fighters, all the fighters up there for Cus. And we're watching a fight with Larry Holmes. And Tyson, 15, he had already won the National Junior Olympics twice, knocked everybody out. We knew he was going to be, uh, it was a good chance he's going to be a really good fighter. Because felt already be heavyweight champ of the world. So we're watching a fight, and watch, and Cuz tells Tyson that if he, if he box with Holmes right now, and we put him in with Holmes right now, in a three-round fight, he could beat him. Now, that's crazy. That's crazy, <laughs> but, it's, but it's not crazy, Ken, because he qualified it. He specified it. He said three rounds. Be- but after three rounds, Holmes would get to you because he's too mature, he's too experienced, and you aren't m- mature and experienced enough to keep it up with this level of fighter beyond three rounds. But for three rounds, with your speed, with your ability, with your punching power, yeah, 
Yeah. You could do damn well with him. And you could hit him with right hands over his jab because when he jabs, you could time him. He doesn't move his head. But again, you don't have the experience to do it beyond three rounds. That's the truth. Well, that's these guys are telling you that this kid, Keyshawn Davis, can go and beat all the best fighters right now. It's not fair. It's not honest. It, it's it's not logical. Yeah, he can beat this level of guys, and yeah, he might be able to do okay with certain top guys in the gym for a couple rounds or in a fight if there were two or three round fights, but they're not. At this level, they're 10 and 12 round fights, and that's where the lacking of experience would come up. That's where the separation would happen. That's where you would find out if he had more than just pure talent. We don't know that yet. So, listen, I, we're the truth sayers. We're, we're the x-ray machine. Yeah, a lot of people, ah, Teddy, you know, the guy, I, I, go ahead, go ahead, put your pom-poms on, go nuts. I don't care what you do in your own home. Go ahead, go, uh, but, I'm here to tell the truth. I'm here to separate the exaggeration. You know, and, and I'm not here with an agenda, good or bad. I'm not, you know, I'm not here howling for my meal that I have to say Keyshawn Davis the best because I feel that that will help me with the promoter, you know, who uh, and a network that signs my paycheck. They don't sign my paycheck. I don't have to do that. I don't have that pressure over me. So... You know, they just, these, I tell you, sometimes they just get too far out there. Some of the commentators, how far they go with their lack of, I, I, I mean, they're over, just, they're not their overabundance of enthusiasm, but how they just go over the top, like you said about that guy, you know, and they exaggerate things. I mean, I used to think that, those John Wick films, and listen, they're a little crazy, those John Wick movies uh, starring uh, Keanu Reeves. Keanu, and, Keanu Reeves. Yeah, and listen, they're crazy. But I, I like them, I like the action. But, you know, he kills like a, a hundred people that all are pretty skilled, you know, fighters, killers with guns, knives, machetes, whatever. He kills like a hundred of them in like a minute and a half. I mean, that's a little bit over the top. A little <laughs> bit. It is. But that's what these... I mean, that's what these guys do. I mean, you know... Uh, I mean, these guys make the John Wick movies look like daytime soap operas. They, uh, they, I mean, they actually exaggerate more than the John Wick movies. Really. I mean, that's, that's, that's rough. That's rough. That's give me those things. Give me. I'm sorry, Ken. <laughs> I can't help it. I gotta get it out. I gotta get it out. So, oh, oh. Hey. <laughs> e S <laughs> H A N K E Y S H A N. Uh, I didn't spell it complete, but you know what? <laughs> I would have been disappointed if Hurrah. you did. <laughs> Hurrah! Hurrah! Who? 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 Ho! Hello! <laughs> Hello! Okay, thank you, thank you. I, you I I'm sorry. Him. You I feel bad. With the old, you gotta get him with the old school. Ra ra sis boom ba. I got a rat trap bigger than a cat trap. I, that's <laughs> I'll do that one next time. Um, I hope there's not a next time. That was. I feel better. Um, take me to Stevenson and Conseco, Conseco, because listen, Conseco's a game guy. Stevenson is a talented guy. That's why when you started talking about talent, I thought you were talking about Stevenson and um, the Southpaw undefeated champion. Go ahead. Well, I, I'll tell you exactly what happens there, and it's like so predictable, right? Keyshawn, um, uh, sorry, Shakur Stevenson, I believe if he isn't still, he was managed or advised by um, the great Andre Wood, who's obviously on the call for ESPN. So, I don't know if he still is because... Yeah, that's why I said he, he was. To the credit of ESPN and Andre, they used to... He would not, he would not call the fights himself Correct. when... when when Shakur was fighting, and now That's he right. is, so I 
don't know that he's still Correct. involved right. in his management. Yep, I agree. But he was at one point, and and the thing that's disappointing there is not. I don't. Nec- I don't have a problem with Andre Ward, but I do have a problem with Tess and the rest of the crew because they're so on. They're so one sided in the call. Now, look, these guys are all, all fighting one sided fights for the most part. Um, but they, but it's so obvious when someone that they're affiliated with, mainly because of Tess. If Tess thinks Andre Woods going, he's almost like so far on the side of of Andre's fighters or guys that are in Andre's like circle. That he's like, hey Andre, watch how watch how biased I'm going to be in favor of your fighter. It's it's he's doing him a disservice. Just call the fight. He's the guy's going to beat the brakes off the opponent anyway. So don't make it so obvious and don't act like he's beating the like the heavyweight champion of the world when he's at 130 or 35 pounds, whatever it is. Anyway, Shakur Stevenson misses weight. He's obviously, it's funny because I saw Rob posted those clips from the last time Shakur fought where you said, this is a big kid. He's not going to be around much longer. And he isn't right. He's, he's basically, he's outgrown the division. Yeah, I said this way before. You're yeah. right. I was ahead yeah. of this one because yeah, he is way big. Ahead of it. He's big. Yeah, when we played the old clips when he missed weight, it was so obvious. You saw it way before he probably even seen it himself. You were like, this kid's huge. He's not going to be around. Look how much bigger he is than the opponent the last time he fought. And um, he lost his titles on the scale, so they were available for um, Canseco, but um, they were stripped from the champ. Miss weight to, the m- weight miss was too egregious, unlike Tank Davis, where they give him time to come back and then let him weigh in in a private you know, basically, like once the press and everyone's gone, uh, Tank runs down and weighs in. I forget which fight it was. I know that the the Tank Davis fans are gonna like attack me now for like calling out what happened w- by just using facts. He missed weight. Yeah, we're came not allowed back. to tell the truth. Come on. Yeah, he missed weight. He came back. The press. Everyone was gone. He allegedly two. Uh, he had like two minutes left to do it, and he made the weight miraculously while no press was in the room. Nevertheless, Shakur must have missed it by a lot because to be stripped of the titles, like no one wants that. The the the, the, the sanctioning bodies. Well, don't they want said it. he was a pound. He was he was less than two pounds. Pound points. Five, right, but my five. point is. The powers that be, ESPN, the sanction of bodies, they don't want him to miss weight. If there is a way that they can get him on weight, they're going to give him every advantage to do it, and he couldn't do it. So it must have been an aggressive weight miss. Needless to say, stripped of the titles, gets in and just beats Canseco up for the entire fight, completely one-sided all night long. But he couldn't get rid of him, and that's, to me, the bigger takeaway. He was much bigger. still, you know, listen, he's a good defensive fighter. Um, Stevenson, that's his probably greatest attribute. But, um, you know, in all fairness, Conseco hit him some clean shots, a good amount. He, he hit him a good amount, of, enough clean shots. And he did it by either timing him while he was punching because that's how you beat speed, with timing. He either yep. timed him while he was punching or he waited till his head came back to the middle and then he timed him in the middle with right hands against the southpaw. Um so Conseco, he you know he had some spots. I mean, it was one sided, no doubt about it. But he had some spots, and he's a game guy. But you know, there was only going to be one winner. To your point, yep. And and he gets and um, Shakur gets the decision. Um, and like I said, he's on to the next. Uh, he's moving up in weight. He can't make that weight anymore. So um, there's some big fights. I think what, what was he one thirty, and he's going to move up to thirty five, right? Yeah, and listen, I want fights I, at thirty five. Yeah, if they can make them and do make them. But <laughs> I I mean, that's, you know, uh, there's a big difference about, you know, what could be and what is and what happens. Yep, but for sure. especially in this sport. But I, the first thing is, again, uh, give me those again. I'm sorry. <laughs> I mean, yeah. Um, there you go. Okay. Ooh, ooh I'm tired. I can't go crazy. Oh, oh, ah, <laughs> uh, Shakur, Shakur, Shakur. Let's go. Let's, all right, okay, Shakur. Uh, because that's what you got. You got a lot. I, after watching a little bit of it, I made a note to myself. I said, now I know what the youngest pound for pound fighter in future great looks like, um, because they told me. They told me. And if they tell me, I have to listen to them. Um, someone with talent, terrific talent, no power, um, 
And he doesn't keep you awake if you're tired. He helps you. You know, he, he helps. He's not maybe as good as Salmonex, but he's not going to he's not gonna get your blood going where you're going to say, oh, wow, I can't sleep now. You know, he, he's not the most exciting fighter in the world. A, a very efficient, very effective. Um, and you would probably be tired anyway if you were watching him on ESPN because it's midnight. Because did anybody miss that, that they come on at like midnight and they do a lot of their shows? It was a Friday night, not a Saturday. They probably didn't want to go up against college football, which is very smart on Saturdays. But I felt like, I really felt like for those historians out there or people that just know a little bit about boxing, and most of you do know more than just a little bit, but... I felt like they were describing Sugar Ray Leonard, Henry Armstrong, and Pernell Whitaker. And maybe also you throw in Willie Pep, uh, the great Will of the Wisp. Uh, because that's that's what it those were the platitudes. And can am I wrong to say that every once in a while these commentators, I know they could go over the top and all that stuff and they howl for their meals. Okay. But can you Sometimes be a little bit honest and put it into at least context. It's not like he's in there with Roberto Duran. So can you put it into a little bit of context? Because the announcers, didn't, from what I've seen, Ken, on other networks with other sports, like like if a, if a Duke basketball team, you know, a top basketball team, North Carolina, whoever, they're playing like Prairie View. Usually the commentators will say, yeah, they're winning by 50 points, but, you know, it is Prairie View, Prairie View. And we have to, not none against Prairie View. I mean, they try like hell, but they don't have the level of talent that the other top teams have. So they will qualify it and they'll tell you, Listen, Duke looks good, but we got to see how they look good, how good they look next week when they step into the tougher part of their schedule and they and they play North Carolina or Gonzaga or whoever, and or Baylor, and they never do that. I used to do that all the time, but maybe that's why I'm not there. But they never. One of the reasons, anyway. Pick your pick, but they never do that. I think. I'm asking the fans a question. Would you guys appreciate that? That if every once in a while they would say, listen, yeah, he looks great. He looks, you know, but he's not in there. Again, he's not in there, you know, with Roberto Duran. He, you know, we got to see. We think that he will be able to bring this talent to the next level, but we don't know yet. It's going to be interesting to find out. I can't wait to find out. I'm going to follow him. Say that, but don't, like insult our intelligence and make it like, you know, again, you don't put it in context. Make it like he's fighting a great fighter. So I know the guy had a amount of fights. He was a, in 2016, he won a gold medal in Brazil and he happens to be from Brazil. You think that helped him win that gold? I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, the guy, the guy wasn't bad. But again, he's not Roberto Duran. So don't, go that crazy and insult our intelligence before we know, before we have a better barometer, a better litmus test of what's truly there. And I want to see Shakur tested. I do. And I don't want to hear. I really don't want to hear that, oh, Teddy, you're not being fair. He's been tested by Oscar Valdez and Jamel Herring. No, he wasn't. Oscar Valdez, I love him, and he was an undefeated champion, but he was too slow, he was too one-dimensional, and too easy for that kind of talent, that kind of style. So, and, and don't tell me about Herring, who's too old and too small, and, you know, don't tell me about those guys. Don't say he was tested. He hasn't been tested. A fight's not a fight until there's something to overcome. He hasn't been one of those fights yet, and... I would, you know, you want to call him all these things? You know, um, you, I mean, you're talking like he's Marvin Hagler. I don't even know that he's John Hagler. Uh, I Really, I don't know who John Hagler is. I don't know. But, uh, you know, I want to see him in there. You know, put him in there with the guys that, 
you know, he's moving up now. So let me see him with Tank Davis, you know, hopefully in the future. Let me see him with Teofimo Lopez. Let me see him with Lomachenko. Let me see him even with Ryan Garcia, you know. And then then I'll start, you know, then I'll, st- I'll throw away the pom-poms then, okay? And I say, okay, now we've had that litmus test. You know, I would think that we would get it there. But what he again, he hasn't been forced to take a deep breath physically or psychologically in a fight yet. He hasn't had to overcome anything. So really, you, you're insulting some people's intelligence a little bit when, when, you, when you do this to us. So break the fight down, Teddy. All right, you come in eight inches and Shakur goes back 10. He controls range really well. And he looks to counter. He's got quick hands. He's not a puncher. That's one thing. He don't have the power. And again, can you give us a little honesty where for most of the fight, he's throwing one punch at a time, two punches, one punch. He's not throwing combinations. I mean, really, we're supposed to go nuts Again, over a hand-picked guy that he's fighting. Guy's a game guy, but a hand-picked guy that he's much more talented than, who's, I think, 33 years old. Shakur is, what, 25? And you're throwing one punch at a time. I'm supposed to get excited. And you're getting hit every once in a while um, by another guy who can't punch. So that was fortunate. Uh, <laughs> uh He's not a finisher. You know, we talk about what he is. He's got speed. He's got ability. He controls range. He's got good eyes. He sees things pretty well. Sees the field of play well. He's not a puncher. He's not a finisher. He gets, you know, he gets you hurt. He don't finish. And, And by the way, as long as I'm putting out, you know, some criticism, I think, uh, proper criticism, you know, um, Fair criticism. Could could the camera guys, the producers, whoever's doing ESPN, could they not break away? When you finally got a little bit of excitement, you finally get a knockdown scored by Shakur. Doesn't happen too often. Hell, his comment don't happen too often. Right? You finally get one. A left hand to the solar plexus, to the body, and they cut away, Ken. They cut away. <laughs> I mean... <laughs> Really? Really? So, he, uh, <laughs> look, he's not making his contract wait. I'm not going nuts. A lot of people banged him over that. I know you're supposed to live up to the obligation. You sign a contract. But I said it a long time ago, as you said and repeated, you know, he, he's a big guy. You can see how much bigger than Conseco he is. I, I don't know how he's been making this weight. Uh, so, and he's still young. So, it, you know, he, he definitely had to move up. Um, I, I'm looking at my notes here. Uh, I want to make sure that I didn't leave anything out. You know, again, uh, the referees. Are the announcers... Maybe they should get their eyes checked because the referee might be coming in the ring next time with a seeing eye dog. No, 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 no. Ken. Now, Ken, he might be because how did he miss all those low blows that were being poured on Conseco? I hope Conseco has already had a family. I do. I hope he's already got a family and and, and a beautiful family and, and a loving family. Because I'd be concerned now. I'd be concerned now if he could still have a family after that. He must have got hit a dozen low blows. <laughs> Ken, he must have, really. I mean, you could feel it in Berlin. And and he, and they're not called. Finally, finally, somebody, I'm telling you, I'm not joking. Somebody must have grabbed him at ringside and whispered in his ear, look, it's looking bad. You gotta make it. You gotta make it look better. And finally, he he warned him. He took a point away for throwing him on the floor. He finally warned him late in the fight after about a dozen of them were delivered without any warning. And and then he takes a point away because 
Shakur throws him to the ground, Conseco to the ground. Then later in a fight, here's the weird thing. He throws him to the ground again. He don't, he don't even want him. It's like, oh, I can't do it now because now it could be bad. I, could, I might have to disqualify him. I might have to take another point away. So I already did what I had to do to make a good show, to make the people think I was being fair. But I can't go, I can't go over the line now and risk <laughs> the, the golden child here, you know, the promoter's fighter, the network's fighter. I can't do that, you know. So it's just, I mean, it was just incredible. Low blow after low blow, not a damn word said. And again, I understand that the that the referee has vision problems, but I guess these commentators have it too, because you know they were they were freaking on mute, they were on mute. Uh, again, uh, I'll see what happens when he. I, I he looked frustrated, uh, Shakur. What happens if he's frustrated with that level of yep. a guy? What happens when he does fight, if he ever does, Tank or Lopez or Haney? I forgot Haney. Throw Haney in there. Lomachenko, Ryan Garcia, you know. I don't know how all, with all those guys, I don't know how we don't see any of those guys fight anyone other than some of the guys you just mentioned. There isn't room for them to fight anyone else. They're, they've all proven that they can beat the brakes off everyone at that next level, below that, below that level you mentioned. Those, to me, are the top-tier guys there. Now we've got to see them fight each other. It's like some of these younger, lighter guys, they're so protected. I give them, it, let them fight each other. These are like money fights, I would think. I'll pay big money to watch those fights. That's an, those, I wanna, those names you mentioned. Match them up. Speaking about names, I want to put a request in to change Top Rank's name. I do. I want to change it to Top Snooze. <laughs> Top Snooze. Top Snooze. Because not only do they go on late at night, they're not giving us competitive fights. And, um, and you got Tess part. screaming in them. That's why you got Tess screaming like, oh, my God, he's gone down. It's to wake I you up. I appreciate you know, it. No, 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 no. There's a, I disagree with a uh, partner with you on this one. I do. I'm sorry. I respectfully disagree because there's a purpose to it. They've. Uh, there's a purpose to it. There's, there is a purpose to him doing that. It's to to wake us up. That's what I mean. It's, it's hey, to keep I us awake. It's to Guys, keep it's almost us over. Awake. Wake up. Don't miss this. It's, it's to keep us from, from snoring. And I'll finish with this. I've said it before. When I'm right, I'm right. I'm going to say it again. It's not going to change nothing. Maybe the fans, uh, who knows. But when will the executives over there at ESPN, realize that what Aram and crew are doing is what they did. And I've said it before, in the 70s and 80s when they scorched earth, they did, <laughs> where they ran ESPN boxing into the ground until finally at that point, the executive, 20 years of it, the executive finally fired them. They had no ratings. There was nothing but non-competitive fights week in and week out. And finally... The executives fired them and they changed over to Friday Night Fights. Um, they're doing it again, Ken. They're, they're using the huge money they get from ESPN to sign top amateurs, promise they will be on TV. They keep the promise. Um, they'll be on early in their career, right away, coming out of the shoot. They're going to get on TV. And then they go and they proceed to build up their records for the next two years by putting them in one-sided fights every week at the expense of the fan, the TV audience. I mean, uh, it's basically top ranks farm system. It really is. Um, the problem, Teddy, is now ESPN's in so deep with them to admit that this isn't working after all the money that's been spent building the franchise. I just don't know how they get out of it. It's almost like they're, they're trapped. They're in a very difficult position. If they want more fights, they probably are going to ask, the promoter's going to ask for more money. And he's basically got them in a compromising position where if you don't fund these additional fights or the additional requests, you continue to get these non-competitive fights. And it's what does ESPN do? What, what do they do no, for No, no, but it's not because they don't have enough money. They got plenty of money. What it is, is that they don't want to put these kids in with anyone and take a shot that they could lose 
and they want to sensationalize them. And it's easy to sensationalize them with these kind of opponents they're knocking out. So they build up their record to 15-0, and 20-0, and 0, and then they'll fit into a title somewhere because they got the juice to fit them in somewhere, the softest spot possible, and they'll win a title, or they won't. But that's where the payoff. But then the problem is they continue cherry-picking where to keep them undefeated, cherry-picking again. And then every once in a while, a fighter come along where the fans will get a bone. They get a bone thrown. But only if they control both sides. They won't allow them to cross the street to another promoter's territory to fight the fight that the fans might really want to see that really is the best fight out there. You know, they got to be in control. You know, it's kind of like Don King years ago. What a quote. Terrible, but but a, a funny as hell quote and an honest quote where he went to Jamaica when uh, he had Joe Frazier and he went and he was with Joe Frazier promoting Joe Frazier. He went in a limousine with Joe Frazier over there to fight George Foreman. And nobody knew how great George Foreman was going to be. So he goes over, he fights George Foreman, Foreman knocks out Frazier. And after the fight, somebody says to him, how do you feel, Don, you know, your, your champion lost. You know, Frazier got knocked out. He said, I came into the ring with the champion and I left with the champion. He had Foreman signed too. I mean, so <laughs> that's, you know, that's what these promoters do, not just top rank. That's what they do. They, they have, you know, they make sure they have both sides. If they don't have both sides, they're not going to make the fight. You know, unless it becomes so humongous, like years ago, Pacquiao and Mayweather, that the money is just so astronomical, they have to make it, even though it's five years too late at that point, but they do finally make it. But when are the fans going to wise up? When are they going to, like, revolt? Um, you know, I, I know a lot of them have. I know a lot of them have. You know, they've told me. They said, we don't watch it no more. We're not there no more. But again, I've said this too. There's, there's an explanation to why this crime goes unpunished, why the executives don't do anything. If it was any other sport, they would recognize what's going on. They would recognize, you know, that that they can't keep putting on games with Duke against Prairie View. The fans won't tolerate it. They they have to put North Carolina on. They have to put Gonzaga. They have to put Baylor. They have to put all these other programs on to satisfy the fans, to put competitive product up. But in boxing, they don't care. They Because A, they don't really watch... The executives aren't really aware of what's going on. They're really not. Now when it comes, it fills their programming. There's a necessary programming slot there, and it fills it. It takes care of their programming. And so that's it. They don't really keep an eye on it. They don't know that these commentators are saying something that if it was said, if it was said during a football game or a basketball game or a baseball game, they would say, what the frick? Get that guy out of the booth. Uh, what is he doing? How is he talking that crap? Are you kidding me? Really? But being boxing, you know, there's an old saying, you don't play boxing. They never played boxing. They know something about the other sports, but they're not familiar with boxing. So they don't know if they're not familiar with the sport. They don't know what makes sense, what doesn't make sense when they hear it and when they see it even. So... That's why you're not going to, unfortunately, you're not going to get changed. And that's why you're going to hear commentators like one of them that is not at ringside, but still one of them is telling you during Chicago, hey, basically, I don't remember verbatim, but basically he's saying, hey, you shouldn't be, you shouldn't be uh, critical of Chicago. We're watching something special here. We're watching special talent here. We're watching greatness here. You know, you shouldn't be critical. Shame on you if, if you're not smart enough to know what you're watching here. How great. What? <coughs> Makes me cough. Makes me cough, Ken. Makes me cough. I mean, what? Really? Are you, are you, are you really willing to insult us and say we're all that stupid? Really? You, I mean, you really are that <laughs> that egotistical that you think you're that much smarter than us, that you can force that on us? 
to not see that he's not in there again. Like I said, he's not in there with a Tommy Hearns. He's not in there with a Roberto Duran that we can't see that. That we can't see that, you know, there's a reason why we're not excited. He, he's not, some styles aren't exciting. Floyd Mayweather wasn't all that exciting all the time. But he was more exciting than this guy. And um, look, there'll be some fights here be better. Styles make fights. His style is what it is. He's he's a smart kid. He's careful. You know, uh, he's defensive oriented. Watching his fights, and I think this is a fair analogy, Ken, and I'll leave it at this. It's kind of like going to a baseball game and you go in there knowing that you're going to see pitching. And you better like pitching. You're not going there to see balls go over the fence. You're not going over there to see a home run derby. You're going over there to see pitching. And if you're not ready to see pitching, and, and I'll tell you, you're going over there maybe every once in a while, you're going to see shutouts. You're going to see shutouts. So, you know, unless you're a fan of pitching, um, you're, you're not always going to be thrilled, you know, especially when you're pitching against minor league competition. I think that's fair. I'm sorry. Yep. I'm not knocking Conseco. Terrific in his own f- field, but not in this field. Yep. Well, <clears throat> let's get to the big one from the weekend, and that was the um, the heavyweight fight. Joe Joyce knocks out Joseph Parker in the 11th round. This, I thought, was a good heavyweight rumble. For me, I was entertained. I like them both. I think they're both really good. I, I like the character that they both show. Joseph Parker can crack for sure. He finally broke, uh, uh, sorry, Joe Joyce can crack. He broke Parker down all night long in the 11th round, finally caught him with a left hook on the top of the head and uh, put him away for good. How'd you like that one? And what do you think of, uh, what do you make of Joe Joyce? How much potential? Again, I'm wrong sometimes. I am. But when I'm right, I'm not afraid to say it. Before it was easy to say, I said a while back on this program that Joyce, I said a couple things. See if I can remember. I One of them I said, Joyce, and this was the most important thing, reminds me of George Foreman. A lot of people thought I was nuts. I wonder <laughs> if they've adjusted that opinion now and they see what I see. And what I saw way back, he reminds me of a George Foreman. He's big, he's strong, He's ponderous. He's a, he's a ponderous puncher, not a snappy puncher. He's hitting you with a club, and he's got a. He comes in here behind that big, strong, long jab, that's like a foam pole. He comes in behind that. He's a little raw. He's a little crude in spots. You know, he's not Muhammad Ali. We get it. Different styles. He he doesn't have that kind of ability, but what he does have is a great resolve a great chin, like George Foreman, a great toughness, and he pushes the fight, the envelope, all night till he gets to you or you get to him. And like I said, he's aggressive. uh, He's big. He imposes his physicality on you. That's... He forces you to fight his fight. He gets so far. He imposes his physical strength and size. And there's something to that. It's not always an automatic to be able to do those things. And he does. He's able to impose that onto the guy in front of him. And as you said, the pressure was there all night. He took some big right hands, Joyce did. He's got a good chin. He swallowed those right hands like biscuits. Um, Not all of them. I think one or two might have affected him a little. But he's a game, resilient, relentless guy. And he finally broke down Parker. I don't know why Parker came in the heaviest of his career. Maybe he thought he had to match the size of Joyce, Joyce also, I don't know why he keeps getting bigger. He was 271 pounds, the biggest of his career. But he looked good. He didn't look bad physically. He didn't look fat, chubby, flabby, whatever. But he's a big man. 
He's a tough man. He's a serious uh, man in that ring. Again, I said also, besides that he reminded me of George Foreman, I said to you on this program a while back, he's going to fight for a title. He's going to be a force to be reckoned with. He's going to be a player. And he's a player. He's a force. He's going to wind up fighting for a title. And because partly because he's over there across the pond, he'll fill a stadium. He'll fill a stadium because the Brits, they follow their heavyweights. They, they follow their fighters, period. They support their fighters. They do. And huge. And it's easier than over here. Again, you don't, I'm not knocking it. I'm being serious. You don't have the Tiger Woods and the Bradys and, the, you, know, uh, or, or, you know, all the Steph Curry and, you know, all, all the, you don't have all the other sports and all those other things and all those other, you know, personalities. So the fighters are promoted well by the promoters over there, all of them, and they become stars, big stars. And the promoters become rich, very rich, richer than a lot of promoters over here because of what I just described, because the fan base is there and they, they know it. That's why they're in the business. And, you know, whether it's Hearn or whether it's, you know, Frank Warren, whoever, they, they've made millions of dollars. They do their job, but they've made me because the fans, the fans are there. They love boxing, and they support these. They don't have all the other noise going on in the room with, like I said, with all lot of other sports. So they support the boxers. Joyce will fill Wembley Stadium against somebody, what you know who depended. And and I tell you, I think I described. Make sure I broke down the fight. I mean, Parker Parker tried to use his legs. Keep more balance, pot shot, you know, with right hands, pot shot with jabs, but he couldn't keep it up. He got broken down. He got worn down. It's not easy. After a while, that ring doesn't feel like canvas. It feels like quicksand because of the pressure, the pressure of a 271-pound guy that keeps coming and thudding, thudding. Not Chris snappy, but thudding punches thudding punches and he mixes it up to the body as well as the head give Joyce credit marvelous marvelous yeah you can hit him but he's got a good chin and to beat him I'm telling you right now it's going to take either somebody with a first of all you're going to have to get a really large ring and you're going to have to get somebody with a with a motorbike with a scooter and and scoot around and make sure you don't run out of gas scoot around Bang, 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 hit him with apples and oranges and tomatoes, whatever. Just thrown from the scooter. Every, and, and, and don't run out of freaking petrol. You're either going to need that or a guy who can hurt him. Slow him down or get rid of him. That's it. And I'll tell you, I, I would pay money to see a number of the fights that I would like to see with him. Um, I would... I would pay money to see him in there with any of the top guys. If he if he fought Wilder, that would be. I tweeted this to my and again, thank you to my great tweet team, um, Twitter team, whatever they're called. Uh, they're great people, great great people. Rob and and um, uh, Ian uh, and Brennan. Ian Mackey. Yeah, Ian and Maggie and Brennan. Um, all of them, they're tremendous. And I I hit them at all different times, odd times, and they're always <laughs> available. They're always available. I was at a wedding up there upstate for my wife's uh, niece, and, and we had to go up there in the middle of the wedding, coming back on the highway. I'm tweeting during the, after the fight, before the, uh, and I'm interrupting these, these good men. But they're always there for me. And for you, for the fans, because we get those tweets up. And I... I would love to see if we saw, there's four fights, three or four fights. If we saw Joyce with Wilder, it would be like the old days when they used to do nuclear hydrogen bomb testing underground in Nevada. Remember that, Ken? In the desert in Nevada, they used to, they used to light off, the, they weren't firecrackers, they were H-bombs. They used to light them <laughs> off underneath the ground. 
and um, do nuclear testing. That's what this would be. Nothing left at the end but a mushroom cloud and maybe maybe a thud. I mean, that's it, w- it would be, you know, if Wada couldn't catch him first and hurt him, which, you know, is possible, and hurt him first, um, Joyce would wind up walking into him and and what it would be, it would be. Uh, the other one, if he fought... If he fought against Fury, if Fury is much more advanced, has many more dimensions to him, much more sophisticated. But if he could survive Fury's right hands early on, then start moving forward, which is what Joyce does, and imposing himself on another big man, two big, two behemoths, like I said. Joyce knows how to use his size really well and impose it on you. So does Fury. Fury has a little bit more dimension than Joyce. Option. Joyce, Fury can use his size sitting on you, pushing you back, or on the outside with his long arms, using his size and height to box. So he's got more options. But again, if Joyce could survive the right hands of Fury early, and then start to make inroads, oh, 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 that, that would be interesting. And then the other one, I can't leave out the greatest winner right now, or one of the greatest winners in boxing, Usyk. Gold medalist, undefeated, cruiserweight champ, unified all the titles, went up, won the heavyweight title, beat Joshua twice. Boy, if, if Usyk, I know, I hear you already, too small. He was too small, supposedly, for Joshua, too. But if Usyk could use those great boxing skills, if he could box and move around and, and just hold his attention with some shots every once in a while and be elusive enough, be enough of a ghost, you know, to stay out of harm's way and, you know, to move to the sides, get the proper angles and keep it up for 12 rounds, boy, it wouldn't be easy. It would not be easy. It would not be easy. It'd be like you in the marathon. It would be hell to get to the finish line. But if he could go through that hell and get to that freaking, that, that, you can't count, that would be interesting. That would be interesting. And here's the last one, because I love you, my, my fans, my brothers and sisters, our brothers and sisters and fans over there across the pond. I miss you. I love you. And this is for you. I think some of you are starting to come around and come around to, to my truth. A little bit. A little bit. And when I'm wrong, I eat your crumpets. I eat them. Because that's what I'm supposed to do. I can give. I got to take. But your beloved Joshua. I know he's on a two-fight losing streak. Okay. But your beloved Joshua. And you still want to see him in fury, even though he lost. If he fights Joyce, he's getting knocked out. See, the other ones I talked about possibilities, right? Here and there for both sides. I'm sorry, nothing against Joshua. I know that you, uh, I almost used the word moron. Anyway, I'm sorry. But you morons out there. Oh, geez. oh man. I said, that, I'm sorry. But you, you idiots out there, uh, uh, that's kind of similar. Um, that that are gonna say, "Oh, you just hate Joshua. You just hate you." Okay, uh, you nick and poop. Um, you dodo bird. Uh, no, no. My job is just to tell you what I know from my fifty years. I think I know at least from my fifty years of experience. Okay, this man Joyce is too big, too strong, and too tough for Joshua, and too hungry right now at this point in his life. For Joshua, who's done great things, but he's not hungry. Like the great Marvin Hagler would say, you know, maybe he's been, you know, sleeping in silk sheets too much now. It's hard to sleep in silk sheets and still get up at five in the morning and do row work and then get in that ring with another man who's trying to trying to destroy you. So I just think that Joyce is too tough and strong and I think he knocks out Joshua 
I don't I don't think Joshua Wood would have a chance. But I tell you, you're never gonna have to worry about that, my beloved friends over there. Because Josh would, would never get in a ring with him. And it's not a knock on him. It's a smart guy. Like Clint Eastwood used to say, Rob, get some match some of this stuff I've been throwing at us today. If you can. You're the best. Um Clint Eastwood used to say, Ken, in those dirty Harry movies, you know, you watch those. They they were good. And Clint Eastwood used to say, a man must know his limitations. Joshua knows his limitations now. So he ain't getting in there with Joyce. No. But anyway, Joyce, again, I, I, he's, he, he's, he reminds me of that big George. And listen, he's got a long way to go to have a career anything like, and I know if he could because he's a lot older than Foreman was when Foreman started. You know, Joyce is up there already. And he's a silver medalist from the Olympics, Joyce. Foreman was a gold medalist. So there's a lot of similarities. But I don't know that he could ever. He probably couldn't because George Foreman is a legend. He's an icon. He is. Um, you know, come back and win a title when you're in your 40s after you won it in your 20s. Uh, and be involved in some of the most monumental historic fights in boxing and heavyweight circles. For, Foreman's a, Foreman is a savage. It, you know, and I say that in a complimentary way, the way my son would always say when he's scouting these great football players. Dad, the guy's a savage. Wow. He's a savage? Yeah, Dad. The guy's a savage. Wow. He's got the whole package. So George Foreman was a monster. But... We're, I'm curious to see how far Joyce will go with these similarities of George Foreman. I really am. I really am. And uh, I think I covered. I think I covered it all. I think that our hate mail will be abundant. You know, it, it'll be healthy. Um, but our love mail will be even healthier because we do get the love mail out there. And listen, please, please, if you're listening, subscribe. All right? Don't just listen. Hit the subscribe button. Please do that. If you want us to keep bringing you the truth and keep, you know, seeing me every once in a while, not too often, not too often, but every once in a while eat a crumpet, you know, and, and dish out love, whether it's overseas, over the pond, or whether it's domestically, our love to our fans, even if it's hard love, even if it's hard love, you know, because sometimes you have to give that. If you're going to be a good parent, sometimes, you know, you got to tell the kids something they don't like to hear. You know, that, no, 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 that's wrong. That was wrong. So if you want to continue hearing that, please, please uh, subscribe. Ken. Subscribe, you, like, and if you want to improve your health and help the show, get a subscription to Athletic Greens. As I've said many times before, especially when you travel and those travel packs that they'll give you with your first purchase are invaluable. Go to athleticgreens.com, use the promo code ATLAS, and they'll send you 10 free travel packs with your first purchase. You not only get the travel packs, you help the show, you help yourself protect yourself against any kind of uh, infections that you may be susceptible to. If you're not getting all your fruits and vegetables, you get 75 whole food sourced ingredients with athletic greens, check out athleticgreens.com and use the promo code Alice. And we appreciate you. We thank you for all for being with us. Like Teddy said, please also subscribe to the show. It helps us immensely. That's it, Teddy special edition, the German edition. Yeah. Thank you, Ken. Thank you. Proud thank of you. you. Um, I for the people out there that say, "Hey, he got a little bit of color. He got a, a tan." Uh, when you're out <laughs> running a marathon in the sun and you're out there, um, yeah, you know what? Some people might call it a burn, actually, more than <laughs> more than a turn. But I just figured that I would. I try to touch on everything, and I figured that I would touch on that. That yes, yes, he he uh, he, he got some sun. He got some sun out, in twenty six miles. I was out there a little longer than expected, so I got an extra dose. I didn't have enough sunblock for the extra 10 minutes that I spent suffering in the last 10 miles. Well, but, listen, uh, um, lots again, of learnings. Again, you, uh, you made us all proud. You made your family proud, which is the most important thing. You made yourself proud. You did not put the white flag up. And nope. you know what? That That's... That's the most important thing is that we don't surrender. 
Yeah, we're going to go through tough things. But those tough things, if we go through them and we give our best, they make us better. They make us stronger. We learn from them. Sometimes you got to lose to win. You know, a lot of people really don't quite hear that sometimes. They don't understand that. That you have to lose. It depends how you lose. Did you learn something? Did you learn something? Did you find out something about yourself? You know what you found out, Ken, if you didn't know it already? And these yeah. is, this is what fighters find out when they're in a tough fight, even if they lose it, but they, they go through what they have to go through. They find out they can depend on themselves. Yep. They find out they can count on themselves when it gets tough, when it's most important to know those things. They find those things out. Those things are important to know in life. They really are. Again, yeah. uh, get home, enjoy your time there. Um, do some training up in the Alps. Do a little yodeling. Do a little yodel. Yeah, but do it better than that. Do I'm going to. Uh, I'm going to be in Chicago in two weeks on the weekend of um, the seventh, eighth, and ninth. The Chicago marathons on the ninth. If any of our great Chicago fans are interested, I might lead a short three mile jog on Saturday morning, the day before the race. If anyone's interested, send me a message on Instagram and I'll post the details if anyone cares and maybe say hello to some of the fans. So I'm sure that, some Teddy, of them will show up. I'm sure they will. Well, they're the best. We have the best fans in the world. We appreciate you guys. And uh, with that, Teddy, it was great seeing you. Thank you for all the kindness and love over the weekend. I appreciate everything. And um, We'll be back with you guys next week with another banger of a show. Thanks for being with us, everyone. Have a great week.